different people get Alzheimer's for different reasons. And that's true, just like people get cancer for different reasons, different carcinogens and things like that. So you can now look to see what, uh, what are the primary drivers for each person. And I should say that uh, most people will have more than one driver, but it's important to determine these because if you can address them, this is the way you're going to get the best outcomes. So type one patients, they have infections, they may have leaky gut, they may have autoimmunity, other things, anything that drives inflammation contributors to, contributes to cognitive decline. Then secondly, atrophic, that's what we call type two, reduce trophic factors, hormones, and nutrients, as I just mentioned. And then there's a type glycotoxic, very common, which we named type 1.5, because it has features of both. You get the inflammation part because you get glycated proteins. These are inflammatory as well as dysfunctional. And then you get the type two part, the atrophic part, because you, your brain no longer responds to insulin the way it should. And by the way, the A beta in your brain actually contributes to that. And it was shown years ago that A beta itself blocks the insulin receptor. So again, it's part of changing the mode in your brain. The A beta is not there to give you a disease. It's there to protect you. But unfortunately, just as we saw in our country, that the downsizing is part of that protection. Type three then, which is what that patient had that I showed you earlier, is toxic. Inorganics, organics, and biotoxins, as I mentioned. Type four, vascular reduce cerebral blood flow. Um, and this often gives you a mixed picture where you have some degree of vascular dementia as well as Alzheimer's. When I was training years ago, it was thought that people would either get Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. And we were taught to do something called a Hutchinsky score so that you could tell which this was. Well, it turns out, guess what? Reduced vascular support is a critical part of Alzheimer's in many, many people. And then finally, uh, type five, and interestingly, traumatic. So there was a study done by Dr. Gareth Roberts in the 1980s showing that people who had automobile accidents with head trauma and then died within a week to 10 days had tremendous increases in their A beta. So again, it's a part of a response. Now in many athletes, ultimately this will be cleared and you end, you end up with the tau part, and that's called CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But with initial head injury, you get an amyloid response to this head injury. So because of all of these different things, this means that if you were going to develop the perfect drug, and we spent years in the lab developing drugs for Alzheimer's, the perfect drug would have to do this. This is the problem. This is too much to ask of a single drug, which is why we always tell the patients, think about it like a roof with 36 holes, you're gonna have to patch the holes. And in fact, giving a drug is a fantastic patch for one hole. So as I said, 36 holes, because there are initially 36 causes that we found, we know of a few more now, as I mentioned, but you wanna go after those, determine what they are, and then patch those holes. And that keep optimizing, that's what gets the best outcomes. And therefore, we have to train new kinds of physicians. And I know many people here are all already very well aware of this and are training in this. We really do need to change our view of how we evaluate and treat these complex chronic illnesses. So of course, the traditional Chinese physicians very good with treating the whole patient. They didn't know anything about DNA, RNI, uh, RNAi, uh, AI, large data sets, any of that stuff. The modern physicians, quite good with those, good with DNA, good with RNA, but don't typically treat the whole patient and look at all these. We really do have to change our view of medicine to network problems in complex organisms. And so, of course, we have to train a new kind of physician here. Um, that recognizes this and deals with all these different things. And so let me show you one outcome here. This is Edward, actually, he was in the, the, the book uh, that's called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Uh, one of the seven people, he did absolutely beautifully. You can see here just dramatic changes, improvements in his scores. He's still doing very well. He started way back in 2013. By the way, the people who started first on this protocol were in 2012, uh, and many still doing very, very well uh, 10 years into this. Here's Marcy, as you can see here, she improved her hippocampal volume. She improved her cognitive scoring as well. She's doing very, very well. Um, here you can see gray matter volume in another patient. 
went up by 23%. So just again, remarkable improvements. I wanna just take a couple of minutes to talk about the most common genetic risk factor. About, two, uh, about two thirds of all the people with Alzheimer's disease are APOE4 positive. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we have about 75 million Americans have it. So about a quarter of the population has it, but they, because they have an increased risk, it's about two thirds of all patients with Alzheimer's disease. That had been known since the 1990s, but it's not clear why this happens, what's actually going on. You end up with Alzheimer's disease, but what's in the black box? Why does this happen? So we started a project in the laboratory over 10 years ago to look inside the black box. And what we found was really surprising. So it turns out this is an amazing gene. Some people would call this the God gene. It has to do with evolution. It has to do with shortgevity. People with APOE4 tend to live a little shorter. And in fact, they shouldn't. Getting, knowing it, getting on the appropriate uh, prevention should allow them in fact to live longer. And Alzheimer's, it's the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. So here's what happened. When we look at the hominids, that developed from the simians between five and seven million years ago, what happened? There is actually a very small number of changes. And actually my wife laughed at me and she's, a, she's an integrative physician. Uh, when I told her, you know, my DNA is actually more similar overall to a male chimp DNA than it is to yours. And she said, well, duh, of course, you know, you guys like the three stooges, you guys like ESPN, stuff like that. So, okay, that's true. Uh, so the bottom line here is, you know, God comes down and uh, touches us with DNA, makes the changes in the DNA. Uh, and uh, you know, our, we're over 95% similar to a to simian DNA in the hominid. So very small number of changes. But among those changes, prominently, were things that have to do with inflammation. Very interesting including APOE. And APOE4 was the primordial, was the original one. So you can see here what led to our evolution as hominids included APOE4. APOE4 is not present in chimps, but it is present in hominids. And here's what happened. So APOE4, unlike the chimps, actually has this arginine 61, which was a threonine in the chimps. So it interacts here with glutamate 255. So positive charge here, negative charge here. So you, what happens is you get this molecule that looks like columns. And in fact, if you then have here, you can see here this, if you now all for 96% of our evolution as hominids, we've all been APOE44, the very thing that's associated with highest risk for Alzheimer's. Now, just in the last 220,000 years, last 4% of our evolution as hominids, with their subsequent uh, mutation occurred, you can see here this cysteine-112. Uh, so cysteine-112 now interacts with arginine-61, and that allows this glutamate-255 to swing freely. So now it looks like a nutcracker instead of looking like columns. They look quite different and they function quite differently. APOE4 is associated with inflammation and with Alzheimer's disease and with cardiovascular disease, APOE3 is not. So as you can see here again, it's just been in the last 4% of our evolution as hominids that APOE3 has appeared, and then just in the last 80,000 years, APOE2. We don't know what supported this because APOE3 is now the dominant one. It's the most common one. It, some people argue this is when people began to use fire and cook. Fire probably appeared before this, but perhaps it did have a role in allowing people to survive with something that is less pro-inflammatory. So as Professor Tunk Finch from USC has pointed out, and I think he's correct, what APOE4 allowed us to do as a pro-inflammatory gene to come down out of the trees, to walk on the savanna, to puncture our feet, to get exposed to pathogens, to eat raw meat and things like that, and not to die from these various organisms. But it is a pro-inflammatory gene. So again, if you go to a place like the, the uh, third world, you look at, for example, the Chimane Indians in Bolivia, they do better if they are APOE4 positive. They do better with the parasites they're exposed to. And similarly, 
in some of the tribes in Africa. They do better, live longer, live healthier if they're APOE4 positive. Now, why is it such a pro-inflammatory gene? This is what we discovered in the lab. It's, it had already been known APOE4 binds to a number of receptors, uh, enters the cell. But what we found, interestingly, it interacts with REL-A, which is part of NF-kappa B. It's a pro-inflammatory intermediary. This complex then enters the nucleus. And interestingly, it binds to over 1,700 different promoters. And this is the work for Dr. from Dr. Ramahan Rao in the laboratory. And so this gives us a new mechanism. It offers us a new look. This thing, APOE, which was, it carries lipids around, so it's thought to be like your butcher, it turns out all to be also to be like your senator. It's giving you the laws of the land. It's affecting over a thousand different genes. And it actually turns down these different genes that affect. So it's a transcriptional repressor. And it, surprisingly, it actually interacts directly with DNA. So it increases inflammation. What it does is it actually turns down several genes that are critical for modulating and bringing down inflammation. And therefore, your inflammation goes higher, stays longer. It's also associated with SIRT1, the very reason that many of us take resveratrol, for example. So it actually turns down SIRT1. And you can look in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's who die with Alzheimer's and are APOE4 positive. Their SIRT1 levels are 60 to 80% lower. It is a striking effect. And then neurotrophins, alters microtubule disassembly, glucose homeostasis. If you look at these groups of genes, you couldn't tell a better story for Alzheimer's disease. So we published a number of papers on this. And as I mentioned, uh, the trial that I'll show you in just a moment here uh, is now posted on MedArchive. You can see that. We published a number of books uh, describing these patients and also the first survivors, uh, which was published last year. Mm -hmm.